Shalom tonight, and I just have a greetings in there, Aras Yadinos Tafari name. I am Aras Yadinos Tafari, or otherwise known as Wendem, Brother Yadon. We want to speak on many things. There's so much things to say right now. Our brother, um, Barana Salasi, Bob Marley, he sung about that, and that is so true. There's many things, there's many halves of the story, there's that half of the story that has to be told and there's so much to say but it seems like within this prophetic dispensation there's so little time to talk about all things we want to so we have to focus on speaking about certain things that are that are important in the order of priority and one of those is to once again go over a subject matter that we have lectured and taught about and we often make a reference to in the teachings of his imperial majesty and this subject matter is the subject matter of Christ and his kingly character who is Christ and his kingly character and exactly what is scripturally meant by Christ and his kingly character because many are of the assumption that I and I as Rastafari are under some sort of illusion or delusion concerning the King of Kings. However, they have not sufficiently at all engaged the main teachings of His Imperial Majesty and that which we call Rastafari doctrine or the true message of Rastafari. And it has happened that even at this present time there is a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, um, false brethren and sisters, for that matter, out there, whether they are willingly doing this knowingly false or whether they are doing this unwillingly, whether they have been taught half or told half the story, such as when we talk about the true meaning of Rastafari. What does Rastafari mean? That does not mean head creator. And some will still argue that, that this one said it and the next one said it, but we say, okay, what's the language of his imperial majesty? What's that royal and holy language? It's the Amharic language, Yamarinya Kwankwa, that's the pure language, right? That's the Amharic language. So when we go to the Amharic language and to the Gutta's roots, we get to find that Ras Tefari does not mean head creator, but in fact, that is half the story. So we also have to take a culpability and even look at ourselves, because judgment has to occur first at the house of God and among those who claim to be his. So we as Rastafari have been going through uh, a serious judgment period. And perhaps there's still some serious judgment period because this is between the father and the son or a father and his son. But on the matter of Christ and his kingly character, I came across this, this um, old uh, article, and I'm sure there's probably other Rastafari that also may have come across this article or even still have this article. This is something called the precepts or the voice of the precept. The voice of the precept. And it was written and composed some years ago by one of our dearly beloved yet um, departed Rastafari brethren, um, Aikael Tafari, composed this particular writ and this particular script. Like with Baran Salasi, A.K. Bar Marley, and and other brothers and sisters, and those who who carry the faith, you know, and proclaim the faith. That was there. That's that's the that's the only thing we recall of them. That they proclaim this um, truth of His Imperial Majesty. Some of us say they may have lost their their lives for the proclamation of this message. And no doubt, we have to recognize this is a living sacrifice. We have to recognize you know, that that is, that is one of the prices that some of us may have to pay and many have already paid for the price of truth. You know, saying in, in the teaching of his imperial majesty, he, he speaks to that particular point. Now, Aika al this beloved brother of ours has passed on, he, he wrote this script called The Voice of the Precept, The Voice of the Precept. And, um, he says um, in this, to give you a, a little insight into it, he says, We beg your indulgence as you join us today and ask that you pick up your Bible and go on a trek through the Holy Scriptures. The passage which we will endeavor to envisage 
is one which took 34-year-old Ika El Tafari, he was about 34-year-old writing and presenting this, a former Harrisonian who now holds a Bachelor of Science or a BSc degree in sociology, gained after three years study at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, where he has lived for the past 15 years close to 10 years to digest. In other words, when he came across this truth of his imperial majesty and the Bible scriptures and other research, it took him nearly 10 years of his life to really digest this because we've been, we've been told so many lies and so many um, untruths and half-truths and some outright lies, such as the whole white Jesus thing, blonde hair, blue-eyed Jesus, and that's, that's just one of the grosser points. You know, when we speak about the Caesar Borgia's image and the so-called Antichrist image, right? However, he goes on to say that it contributes overwhelmingly to the Rastafari way of life. And I say, amen to that. And may our God and Father, Abu Kaddus, in the name of Jesus Christos, keep the soul of our brethren, Aikel Tafar, Barana Salase, and other brothers and sisters who truly were seeking to walk the way of the King of Kings and Christ according to their conscience, according to what they knew as, as truth, but are no longer here with us. But we have faith that we will see them again in the land of the living. This does overwhelmingly contribute to the Rastafari way of life. The devout spiritualist now entertains, and its prophetic sequence bears much re re relevance to the current trauma, the current world trauma, so that, in effect, it is scintillatingly topical and enlightening. We now introduce you to the narrative voice of Ika El Tafari, one of the leading vocal organs of the, quote, house of the Nyabingi. In my father's house, there are many mansions, actually, a, man, a mansion of the Nyabingi, which called himself the Nyabingi House, of course. But the first part of his um, essay here is called Christ and His Kingly Character. And although he made no direct reference to it in the particular um, work that he, that he wrote here, in studying the Schofield Study Bible with some of the tribesmen, the 12 tribes, basically, they're the ones you know, you get sometimes a bit here and there, you know, in one's coming forward. And we pick this up from the 12 tribes, from fellowshipping among the 12 tribes of Israel. And they said the Schofield Bible, His Majesty recommended the Schofield Bible as a good English version. And upon hearing that and taking it in, in the spirit of truth, we went out, we got a Schofield um, reference or study Bible. And in the process of studying that Bible, it really began to clear I and I overstanding because it gave us non-denominational information. They wasn't trying to defend a particular um, Christian denomination, but trying to defend the, the, the truth of Christ, you understand, in spirit and in truth. And although they may be Europeans, so forth and so on, we acknowledge that not all Europeans had a hand in white supremacy or the slave trade, so forth and so on. But in prophecy, we are dealing with the white supremacy, the Gentile world domination and dominion that came out of the Greco-Roman world. This is, if you don't understand that and, and recognize that is a part of what we know today as white supremacy or the rule of the so-called Gentiles. So if you ignore that, it's going to be very hard for you to see the picture in its fullness. So in our perusing the Schofield Study Bible, a hard copy of the Schofield Study Bible, we came across a passage right here when you get to Revelation chapter 5. So this is Revelation chapter 5 right here, right? And then if you come up to this portion right here, you might see where it speaks of, um, it speaks of Christ in his kingly character. There's a, sub, a subheading, a subsection, Christ in his kingly character. So we found this to be particularly interesting because this is the very same area 
where many of us as Rastafari, as, as newbies, as, as, as novices, newcomers, we're still young in the knowledge, these are areas that those of us who have received any instruction from other brothers and others in the faith, these are some of the main areas in the scriptures and in the Bible in the groundation that we've come across. And this particular area here, where it says Christ in his kingly character, gives references to Isaiah, Isaiah um, uh, 11 and, and 1, as well as to um, Jeremiah 23 and 5, Luke chapter 1, verse 32 to verse 33, where it speaks about Christ in his kingly character opens the book. Now, what's very interesting, and this might just be a part one of a, of a, of a series, because what we're going to try to do is make as clear a presentation of this, and we will ask and even beg our brothers and sisters and those interested to go and grab pen and paper, get a journal, get a study journal, and actually to go through these things yourself and to study this for yourself, not accepting what we're saying automatically as being true, and please don't dismiss it as being false, because... Well, not what if, but just for your sake, suppose it is true, and you have not even entertained that, you will be without excuse, because one came to you, one presented it to you in patience and love and in due diligence. So, as it says, try every spirit and, and test every message. You understand? Test this message before you just dismiss it. You over So, in this particular section, it begins and says, and one of the elders saith, to me, it says unto, but un means not, and un is the name of the devil. So we take that out, except where it's necessary, when it's actually saying something is unclean. That still says unclean, but in English sometimes you see unto, and that actually means not to. So you might hear us read, and your Bibles might say unto, and you think that's a mistake. No, that's purposeful that we take off un and just say it straightly to. So it says, and one of the elders saith to me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, or Yehuda, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof, period, right? So, of course, we say the lion of the tribe of Judah, Hala Selassie, the lion of the tribe of Judah, H-I-M, Hala Selassie, the first elect of God, King of Kings of Ethiopia. Is there any other? No, there is no other. Was there any dispute that he was the lion of the tribe of Judah for all those years he was before the world and everyone knew so? No, there was, there was absolutely no dispute. If anybody had a dispute about it, they should have made a dispute then. But now many people are saying that he called himself, trying to put little suppositions there as though it's not true, but they have not proven or even really attempted to prove that's not true because the more they get into it, the more facts and evidence they're going to find because this is our testimony, and it's other brothers and sisters who came to Rastafari thinking, I know those Rastas are dealing with something false and not true, so I'm going to check it out. I'm going to prove that they're false. And anyone who has done due diligence, you understand, with a, with a clean conscience and, and a, true, a, a, true, a spirit of truth approach, you understand, has come across this truth and that there's much truth, whether they could accept it all or not, they've recognized that there's a lot of truth to what the Rastafari is saying. You understand? However, of course, we're criminalized and, and even demonized, you know, by some of the accessories of Rastafari, such as the so-called ganja and the marijuana, and then they link that to so-called drugs and gangs and so forth and so on. When, if you look at the true Rastafari, you understand, you will have to see it, you understand, in the same light as one would see the so-called European Jews. We speak about repatriation. That is the Aliyah. We speak about us being persecuted as a people. You understand? We point to the prophecies in the scripture that actually fit this people even more so than the so-called Jews. You understand the white European German and Polish Jews, even though many of them can point to periods of persecution. But to the point of the diaspora and the Americas and the Caribbean, you understand, we must be able to put matters in their proper order again. So anyway, it speaks about a book. And now here's what's very interesting. We might have to pick up on a second part of this, you understand, because we don't want to rush this particular teaching. It's very important to do due diligence to each of the, the, the main proofs and points that we present that we came across as the Imperial Majesty's Bible. 
You understand? Or the what's called often the authorized Amharic Bible, the Emperor's Bible. It's also called um, the revised Amharic Bible. There are different names for this particular Bible, but in truth, its true name, as his Imperial Majesty said, its rightful name is the Methaf or the Methaf the Methaf Kedus. Now, what's interesting is what it says right here in um, Revelation, where it speaks that if we go from the first um, verse, because we just had the fifth verse, so we just have four verses to connect it, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof? Question. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither or neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And then it speaks that, and one of the elders saith, Unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, one thing that's very interesting about this is that when we look at kings or emperors, especially the Christian emperors or kings of different countries, whether European or, or African or any other place in the world, we find that there's only two kings, there's only two rulers, you understand? West and East, who authorized for a full and a complete translation of the scriptures, you understand, into their respective languages. One was King James, the King James Version of the Bible. Secondly was Haile Selassie I. Now, this is very interesting. The fact that the only authorized translations from the older languages, now the King James, the Vulgate, the Septuagint, the Masoretic Scriptures, so forth and so on. But for Haile Selassie I, we know that Ethiopia has one of the oldest, if not in some ways the oldest, ancient recordings of sacred scriptures. In fact, you hear people talk about the Book of Enoch. You might hear people talk about Little Genesis or the Book of Jubilees and various other scriptures you know what I'm saying, that were lost. People heard the name of it, but they, did not, they were not able to see the book itself. And now what's very, very interesting is the one who was able to do this, you know what I'm saying, was under the administration and the government of his imperial majesty. And his imperial majesty's title is known as the Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah or in the Gutters the ancient Ethiopic as Moa Anbesa Zeim Negeda Yehuda, which translates perfectly out of the ancient Gutters. This is the very same title out of the same ancient, this same ancient scriptures. Now, in order to fully understand this, we might have to review the past, if you're not familiar with it. King Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and one thing about Brother Ikael's um, voice of the precept paper right here that we endeavor to go through, you understand? He goes through such details, you understand? He gives some reference points to such hidden areas. As the Queen of Sheba even said upon visiting King Solomon, she said that the, the half has not been told, that not even the half has been told. And even the Messiah, Jesus Christos, Yeshua HaMoshi, would also say during his visitation, he would say that the Queen of the South would rise up in judgment with this particular generation. These are very important points to remember. But when we speak about this book of the seven seals, one of the interesting things, I mentioned this before, but we'll wrap up this first part with this right here and then hope to continue with the um, subsequent parts hereafter. This book, it says that it was sealed on the back side of the book. Now, what's interesting is that the back side of the book is not this side. This is a cover. People call it the back. But actually, the back side of the book is this part, this margin part. Because as you hold the book in your hand, notice what you see, the back of your hand. 
the back of the book. So if anyone's holding the Bible, especially in a, in a reading mode, they're holding it, the back of their hand, and on the back you see right here there are seven seals. Now, these seven seals, oh, one more thing I need to mention, that in the ancient language to say seal, to seal something, is likened to our modern word, to print. So if we say today, to seal something, you'll say in the ancient language, the process of sealing something was to print something. Because remember, all the ancient scriptures then were handwritten. And it's his imperial majesty as Aras Tesari Mekonin or Rastafari Makinen, who was the first to bring the printing press. Only a couple of um, maybe, maybe no more than a decade or two after the printing press was really developed and in operation in Europe, his imperial majesty brought the first printing press, the first printing presses into Ethiopia with the express purpose of fulfilling this prophecy. You understand? And right here, as you can see, let me get a little bit closer. It says there are seven letters. On the top, there are four letters. And on the bottom, there are three letters. Now, how interesting is it that when we look at the Bible itself, the Bible is divided into seven types of scriptures. There are seven types of scriptures. For example, firstly, there's the Torah, the Orit. Secondly, there's what's known as the books or the Metzahist like the Metzafe Yasu and the Metzafe Cherut and, you know, the Metzafe Mesafent, Judges and Ruth and Joshua, you understand? Then there are also what's known as the Mesmorat or the, the Psalms, not just the Mesmora Dawit, that's one type of Psalm. There's also the Mechalye Mechalize Solomon or the Song of Songs of Solomon. And there's also a very important book, called Sikok Awe Eremius, or the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Now, this is very, very interesting. Now, we have three books. The fourth type of scripture in the Old Testament, the Belui Kidan, is the Tinbit. You understand? The Tinbit or the Tinbitoch, the prophets, the books of the prophets, so-called major and minor all together. They're all articulating one vision in the best language that they knew possible. You understand? That's also another matter that we'll, we will touch on. Now, there are four seals on the top which say Metzhaf, Metzhaf or book. Then on the bottom it says uh, Kedusi or Kedus. Now, Kedus means holy, means holy. Now, in the New Testament, we have three types of scriptures. Firstly, we have the Wengel or the Gospel. Then we have the um, Melikit, you understand, or the Epistle, the didactic letters, the teaching letters, the Epistles. And then we have a very special book, you understand, and that very special book is known as Ye Johannes Rai, often called the Revelation of St. John. But if one would literally interpret it, it's the vision of Yah's grace, or the vision of Yah's grace. After all, the name Johannes actually means the grace of Yah, or interpreted the grace of Jah. So we have seven books, seven seals. Notice how the seals are here. There are four on top, and there are three on bottom. And the four on top are like the Old Testament, the three on the bottom are like the New Testament. So these are just other, other um, true points. These are the main points. The main point should be obvious, that the Davidic and the Solomonic throne was established in an African country, a black nation that we know as Ethiopia. That Ethiopia we find in the Old Testament, we find Ethiopia in prophetic areas of scripture, mostly for good. But the Almighty is not partial. We also have judgment verses concerning Ethiopia. Some of our Hebrew Israelite fam, you understand, who are on another extreme, you know, another extreme, but they still are based on the basic truth that we as the lost sheep and slaves, so-called Africans, are the Beta Israel. We are the Israelites. Of course, they point out that one Scripture, but that scripture is important because we see that the Almighty is not partial. If the people who we love goes astray from his way, he, being just, must judge. So, 
we're going to continue a little bit more with this particular um, teaching of Christ and his kingly character. We can call this the basic introduction, as well as a basic introduction to the book of the seven seals and how and why his imperial majesty is the returned Messiah, is Christ in his kingly character. Salam tanat, ena yistalim.